Now that Project Mercury was fully in motion, what was the next move? After one successful suborbital flight, the plan was to make sure they didn't just get lucky and do it again. Mercury Redstone 4 was to be a complete repeat of Mercury Redstone 3, a suborbital crewed flight to the same apogee of 116 miles or 187 kilometers. The pilot was to be Virgil Gus Grissom, with John Glenn as the backup pilot. With the Soviets preparing to repeat the orbital flight of Yuri Gagarin with Vostok 2, which would launch at the end of August, the flight of Mercury Redstone 4 was first planned for July 16th, then July 21st, 1961. Grissom named his spacecraft Liberty Bell 7, and, for an extra flair of creativity, gave it a white, irregular stripe of paint meant to imitate the crack in the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia. Officially named Mercury Capsule Number 11, the spacecraft was actually the first to come off the production line with a center trapezoidal window instead of two porthole windows as Shepard had flown on Freedom 7. Number 11 also had a feature that was entirely new, an explosive hatch release that would allow the astronaut to get out of the spacecraft quickly in the event of an emergency. This hatch release would later prove to make Liberty Bell 7 the first near-miss in NASA's history of crewed spaceflight. To be honest, the hatch of the Mercury spacecraft could almost have an entire video itself, and because it was very key to this second crewed flight, let's talk about it a little bit. The original Mercury exit procedure which the crew had been trained on was to climb out through the antenna compartment at the top of the spacecraft. In order to do so, he would have to remove a small pressure bulkhead, making it a difficult and slow procedure. Concerned about possible emergency situations, it was believed that removing an injured or unconscious astronaut through this top hatch would be virtually impossible. The original side hatch was bolted shut with 70 bolts and covered with spacecraft shingles, making it equally slow and difficult to open. McDonnell aircraft were tasked with coming up with a quick release mechanism, and they came up with two. First was a hatch that used a latching mechanism, allowing it to open more easily, and were used on both the flight of Ham the Chimpanzee on MR2 and Alan Shepard on MR3. However, the lash design was too much weight to use on the planned orbital version of the spacecraft, so a second design was introduced, an explosive release hatch. This design used the same 70 bolts of the original design to secure the hatch, but each bolt had a tiny hole bored into it, providing a weak point. A mild detonating fuse was installed between the inner and outer seal of the hatch, and when ignited, would create enough gas pressure to cause the bolts to fail and the hatch to blow out and away from the craft. The explosive hatch could be fired in two different ways. On the inside, there was a knobbed plunger. The pilot could remove a pin and then press the plunger with a force of five or six pounds, which would detonate the explosive charge, shearing off the bolts and propelling the hatch 25 feet away in one second. If the pin was not removed, the plunger could still detonate the charge, but would require around 40 pounds of force to do so. Additionally, on the outside of the hatch, rescue personnel could blow the hatch by removing a small panel and pulling a lanyard, similar to designs already existing on fighter jets. For the first two launch attempts, July 16th and July 18th, weather postponed the mission before Grissom had a chance to board the spacecraft. On July 19th, Grissom was on board and there was only 10 minutes and 30 seconds left on the clock when the flight was, once again, rescheduled to July 21st. On that morning, Grissom entered Liberty Bell 7 at 8.58 a.m. and the 70 hatch bolts were put into place. However, 45 minutes before launch, a hold was called when a pad technician discovered that one of the bolts was misaligned. During the 30-minute hold, McDonnell and Space Task Group engineers decided that the 69 remaining bolts should be sufficient, and the misaligned bolt was not replaced. At 12.20.36 UTC, Liberty Bell 7 lifted off of the pad. Ignition. Lift off! Uh, roger, this is Liberty Bell 7. The clock is operating. Loud and clear, Jose. Don't cry too much. Okie doke. Immediately following ignition and liftoff, Grissom would later admit that he was a little bit scared, but felt his confidence build in parallel with the acceleration of the rocket. He was amazed with how smooth the liftoff went, but then noticed that, as it went along, he could sense more and more severe vibrations, though they were never violent enough to actually impair his abilities. He stayed calm and watched the instruments for the redstone, seeing the launch progress normally as his cabin pressure sealed off around him. As the rocket came close to finishing its powered flight phase, Grissom looked out the window and saw a sudden change in color of the horizon, from light blue to jet black. He was then distracted by the noise of the abort tower firing itself away right on schedule. He felt a thump as it separated and washed it through the window as it trailed off in a plume of smoke. At 2 minutes and 22 seconds after launch, the Redstone's engine shut down and Grissom was disoriented for a moment, feeling like he was tumbling as he transitioned from high to zero gravity. However, he was back in control of his faculties well before the end of the 10 seconds between engine cutoff and separation from the booster. 
He felt another thump as the posigrade rockets pulled the spacecraft loose, and as the spacecraft turned around, he tried to get a look at the spent booster, but he was never able to see it. Much like Shepard's flight, now was the time to test out the manual controls. However, Grissom was a little busy staring out the window. He was fascinated by the sight of the Earth from space, and it took him several seconds to tear his eyes free and look at his instruments. When he finally made a pitch movement, he went past where he intended, and spent several seconds trying to correct this before making a yaw movement and doing the same thing. There was only a short amount of time the astronauts were safe to make these maneuvers, and because he had taken so long to do the first two, he omitted the roll movement. Now that the practice maneuvers were finished, he was free for a few moments to observe what he wanted, so he moved so that he could see the ground below him. He saw some land between the clouds, but he wasn't certain where it was, and then suddenly, the Florida Cape came into view with such clarity that Grissom could barely believe he was over 150 miles or 240 kilometers away from it. I can see the coast, but I, I, I can't identify anything. Roger, 4 plus 40, guys. He saw Merritt Island, the Banana River, the Indian River, and an airport runway. South of the Cape, he saw West Palm Beach. Gus Grissom was in full overview effect, in awe at the sight of the Earth from space, with his thin skin of atmosphere keeping out the rest of the cosmos outside. Around five minutes into the flight, it was time to prepare for re-entry. Grissom moved the capsule into the correct orientation with the heat shield facing forward and initiated the retro rocket sequence. When they fired, it gave him a strange feeling, as if he had stopped moving in the direction behind him and was now moving forward, though he was simply slowing down. A few moments after the retrofire completed, he saw two of the spent rockets pass across the periscope view as the package was jettisoned. Re-entry went smoothly as condensation and smoke trailed off the heat shield while the spacecraft plummeted back into the atmosphere. He saw and felt the drogue chute deploying at 21,000 feet, and then the main parachute at 12,000 feet. Grissom took a look as it unfurled, seeing two small tears in the fabric. They worried him, but everything stayed intact while he slowed down to splashdown speed. Grissom heard a clunk. The landing bag had dropped in preparation for impact. At this point, he removed his oxygen hose and opened his visor, but left the ventilation hose attached. Impact was unremarkable, feeling much milder than Grissom had expected, although he felt the spacecraft heel over in the water until he was laying on his side, though he believed that he had been upside down at the time. Gradually, the spacecraft righted itself, and as the window came above the water, Grissom activated the rescue aid switch. Liberty Bell 7 was complete, and now was the point where it begins to get interesting. Gus Grissom prepared to be recovered, disconnecting his helmet and neck dam. Recovery helicopter pilot James L. Lewis, who was then around two miles away, radioed Grissom and asked if he was ready for pickup. Grissom replied that they should wait five minutes because he wanted to record his cockpit panel data with a pencil and paper, which took some time in the gloves of his pressure suit. After he had logged the data, he told the helicopters to approach for pickup, then remove the pin from the hatch cover detonator and laid back in his seat. In his own words, I was lying there, minding my own business, when I heard a dull thud. The hatch cover blew away, and Liberty Bell 7 immediately began to fill with water and sink. Having unbuckled himself earlier, Grissom quickly removed his helmet and grabbed the instrument panel, using it to hoist himself through the hatchway. The co-pilot of the recovery helicopter, preparing to cut off the spacecraft's antenna whip with a long pole, watched the hatch cover fly off, strike the water five feet away, skip over the waves, and then see Grissom crawl out and swim away in a hurry. Believing the pilot to be safe and in good shape at this point, James Lewis quickly maneuvered his helicopter to try and recover the sinking spacecraft. They went so low that the helicopter's wheels were in the water as they threaded a hooked pole through a loop at the top of the craft. The capsule then sank below the water, but the cable attached to the pole went tight, indicating that they were holding on to it. Just as they moved to throw Grissom a personnel hoist, Lewis called a warning that the helicopter's engine was in danger of failing due to the strain of holding the capsule. Grissom, having swam over to try and assist, saw that the capsule was attached properly and looked up for the personnel line. Instead, he saw the helicopter start to move away. Around this time, Gus Grissom started to feel afraid. He realized that he was not riding as high in the water as he had been earlier. Air in his pressure suit was escaping through the neck dam, and the more air he lost, the less buoyant he became. The second recovery helicopter was moving in, and the water washed around by his rotors was clashing with that of the other helicopter, making swimming very difficult. He was angry and scared, looking around desperately for help as his head went beneath and above the waves. As the second helicopter came closer, he saw the face of pilot George Cox. George had retrieved both Ham the Chimpanzee and Alan Shepard on the first Mercury flights, and the sight of them now calmed Grissom down somewhat. George tossed the horse collar lifeline straight to Grissom, who quickly wrapped himself into it, backwards. He decided very quickly that he didn't care, and was lifted out of the water after swells took him below twice more. The first helicopter continued to attempt to raise the sinking Liberty Bell 7. 
With the capsule weighing well over 5,000 pounds with all of the water in it, the helicopter was struggling to raise it high enough to drain the water from the impact bag. Like an anchor, it prevented the helicopter from moving in any direction except up or down. After a few attempts to bring it clear of the water, Pilot Lewis decided that he didn't want to risk losing two crafts in one day and cast loose, allowing Liberty Bell 7 to slowly sink beneath the water. Aboard the nearby aircraft carrier, Rear Admiral J.E. Clark noted that the depth of the area the spacecraft was sinking into was 2,800 fathoms, 5.1 kilometers, or 3.2 miles. A fair amount of controversy followed the flight and sinking of Liberty Bell 7. Gus Grissom maintained that he did not manually activate the hatch cover detonator. An independent review of the incident raised doubts that Grissom had blown the hatch, and it seemed that the astronaut office didn't believe he had done it either, as he maintained his position in the prime rotation spot for future flights. Everybody liked Gus and wanted to believe him, but there was a lack of explanation as to what had caused the hatch to blow that left a shadow of doubt around him. Until three Mercury flights later, when Wally Shira stepped up to the plate to prove for a fact that Gus was innocent. Sigma-7 was sitting on the deck of the recovery ship after its flight. Shira was still inside, asking to be towed to the ship rather than climb out while he was in the water. As it sat there, all of a sudden, the explosive hatch of Sigma-7 was blown. Shira climbed out and showed everyone his right hand. As he had expected, the kickback from the manual trigger left Shira with a visible injury to his hand, something Grissom didn't have. In a 1965 interview, Grissom speculated that the hatch had actually been blown by the external lanyard, as it had only been held in place by a single screw. Decades would pass before Oceaneering International, an engineering and applied technology company based out of Houston, set out to recover the sunken Liberty Bell 7. Kurt Newport, head of the team, found the spacecraft in 1999 after 14 years of scouring 24 square miles of open ocean. They first used sonar, mapping out potential targets over a period of weeks. Finally, when they were able to send a robotic craft down to investigate the targets, they found it after checking out the very first one. It's got some height to it. Oh my god. This is it. I don't believe it. <laughs> I was supposed to go call some friends at 8 o'clock. This never happens. Oh this yeah, never, it does. It never happens True to me. Their first attempt to raise the craft encountered a problem with its cable system, which snapped after hours of attempting to repair it, leaving their robotic craft down there with Liberty Bell 7. When they returned for another try, it took several more days to reacquire the spacecraft's exact location. They then had to establish the status of the depth charge the craft had been equipped with, designed to help locate it if it ever sunk. It had never gone off, so it took some time to figure out whether or not it was still a danger. Finally, on their second attempt, Liberty Bell 7 was successfully raised to the surface, cleaned up, and now sits in the cosmosphere in Kansas, in remarkable condition for something that spent 39 years at the bottom of the ocean. Virgil Grissom remained a prominent figure in NASA, becoming their first astronaut to visit space twice when he flew the first crewed Gemini mission back in 1965 alongside John Young. They would be the first crew to demonstrate that a spacecraft could alter its orbit with the use of thrusters, a key part of the technology and applications that would be needed to carry humans to the moon. In 1967, Gus Grissom was one of three crew members of AS-204, which was planned to be the first crewed mission of the Apollo program, testing the Apollo Command and Service Module in low Earth orbit and being launched on a Saturn 1B. He and his other crew members, Edward White and Roger Chaffee, were in their command module on the pad performing a launch rehearsal about a month before the launch date. Grissom, as well as the other Apollo astronauts, had voiced a lot of concern about the module beforehand, mainly surrounding the amount of flammable material in the cabin, which was filled with a pure oxygen environment. The crew were so concerned that they gave a parody crew portrait to Joseph Shea, who had given the spacecraft a passing grade. Written on the other side of the photo was, quote, It isn't that we don't trust you, Joe, but this time we've decided to go over your head. Frustrated with the slow rate of changes to the spacecraft to fix its glaring issues, Grissom took a lemon from a tree by his house and hung it on the Apollo simulator. Sitting in the capsule, the astronauts were waiting for mission control to troubleshoot a severe communications problem and running through their checklists again. Suddenly, a momentary increase in voltage from an AC bus triggered a spark and then a fire. The astronauts were heard exclaiming that there was a bad fire and that they needed to get out, but they couldn't. The fire had caused a dramatic increase of pressure inside the cabin, and as a result, the astronauts couldn't pull the hatch open. They were trapped inside, and all three perished. Apollo 1, as it was named after the fact, 
would stall crewed Apollo flights for nearly two years while the incident was investigated and a complete redesign of the Apollo spacecraft was ordered. When Apollo did finally land on the moon, everyone would agree that it had only been possible through the tragic sacrifice of Ed White, Roger Chaffee, and Gus Grissom, the second American in space. If you enjoy this content, consider hitting the subscribe button. If you really enjoy this content, consider donating on Patreon, becoming a member, buying some of my books on Amazon, or buying some of my merch. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you over the curve, Space Cowboys.